Hello everybody, James here, WSI, my next guest, a three-time WWE Women's Champion, a two-time WWE Divas Champion, one of the M's in M&M, Melina Perez. How are you this morning? <laughs> I'm doing good, thank you for asking, how about you? Oh, you know, I was oh, stressed, <laughs> stressed as always. Do you know, I meant to say this before we start recording, I know, you know, I do the research in everyone I interview. And of course, because uh, then it'd just be just me and you just staring at each other for a couple of hours and we wouldn't know what to do, you know. And um, so in the back of my mind, I thought, Melina, I'm sure, tore her ACL once. And I tore my ACL last year. And oh what a miserable, oh, what a miserable injury that is. How did you do it? Oh, I, I did it. Um... So I did, it was, it was off of something really small. So it was during one of the live events for your, for raw. And I was doing my comeback from a tag match and it was just one little pivot. So like I hit a clothesline and I think maybe I hit two, maybe just one, but it's that one pivot. And I think my toe stuck and it just snapped during a turn, just a pivot. Oh, did it, get, it, just, did it I, get stuck in the mat kind of thing? Or? Yeah. Yep. Something I've done thousands of times, and just that one moment in time, it, it that turn, I felt it's like you feel all the little strings in your 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 tendon just. And then, uh, as soon as I felt that, I just knew like oh, and then all of a sudden I couldn't take a step and I just crumbled. What was what was the specific and, injury? Was it just the ACL, or was it anything else with it? Oh, just the ACL. Oof, well, thank goodness. So it's like even if I could walk before surgery, I could walk forward. But if I move to the side a little bit, my leg would completely collapse. Yeah, it's the uh, stability that goes, isn't it, that you notice more than anything? It was one of those ones where it just like whoosh, swelled up immediately. Oh, yes. Uh, sadly enough, I think my ankle injury, the my broken ankle, like shattered in three pieces. So I think that hurt more than the ACL. The ACL was just brutal for the fact that you can't do anything and it's just miserable. Oh, there was this one time I had any, um, I think I tore my MCL during when I was in the UK and there was a flight back and I had to fly back home. Oh, no. So I flew to Florida and some guy was getting his luggage on the air, airport or at the, in the airplane and he dropped his bag on my knee. <laughs> Why would you do that? I have a brace on. <laughs> I bet you didn't say why would you do that at the Sorry. time though. Huh? I bet you didn't say why would you do that at the time though. I bet there was more choice words. <laughs> well, I did cuss, then say why would you do that? Oh, fair enough. <laughs> what was the ankle injury then? I don't know the ankle injury. So what happened there? Well, that was another tag match. It was myself and I want to say oh, it was me and Mickey versus Natalia and Lisa Marie, and. Yeah, I just got pushed off the top turnbuckle onto the floor. I didn't land on, like, with my feet evenly distributed. So it was all on one leg. And I landed all on one heel. And it shattered my heel and got lodged into my ankle. Huh. I was like, oh. <laughs> what, tried was, my best. <laughs> what was the recovery period on that one then? Oh, I want to say a total of 10 months, I think. <laughs> Something like that. Maybe it's late less. Maybe it was eight. I can't. I can't remember. It's been so long, but it was forever. Okay, sorry, we had to put dog out there briefly. Um, do you know what? Actually, before we uh, get into you know the whole career and all the questions and all the games and stuff I've got for you lined up, uh, I like the old WWE's women women's belt. I mean, it was a bit simplistic, like the oval and the red word and everything like that. I was not a fan of the divas belt with the pink butterfly where do you fall on that issue the sad part is is of course like because i love history so i think i annoy people because i love the history of things i'm not like a big historian you know i don't remember details dates this and this and that but there's this thing of the knowing of it all and when it comes to that title it was such a beautiful title because everybody that i looked up to that i watched growing up like held that title there was something so significant when you hold that that exact same item that somebody else that you looked up to or has been what you've been through has held it's a it's a totally different feel and it's a bigger honor when you win it because of that all that history 
of that one thing that somebody else has held before you, like physically held. It's a beautiful not knowing of, of what that is. And when it comes to um, the Divas title, it was an honor to be able to, what they told me was, because I was, I was like, mm -mm. <laughs> like, no, this is weird. But they said it has to start somewhere. Any title has to have, have a beginning of a lineage. And you are the ones who has to create it and make it worth something. So when they told me that, it made me realize, okay, I got to do what I got to do and make this mean something. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to see like, okay, we put in all this work to make this title mean something. And then they just discarded it. Like, yeah, why'd you have to get rid of the old one in the first place? But it did, the Divas title did get a lot of recognition in the sense of if you weren't in wrestling, say when I go through airports, everybody would stop. And when I take it out, everybody would notice it more. It was so weird. I think maybe the old one, people thought maybe it was a replica or it was a, unboxing um, thing or something i don't know what they thought it was but it didn't make people stop as much they just like look at it but with the divas title it was more of a an attraction for people who just weren't really aware so it was an interesting thing that i thought well maybe this does bring people in maybe it does do something for for women's wrestling in a sense of like hey like look at this it's something that's different but what hurts to me is that Nowadays, like you can't say, oh, you're going for the gold because the titles, the championships aren't even gold anymore. They're all, you know, silver or I mean, I would say they're platinum, but we know they're not. But <laughs> but it's just it's I guess I miss having the gold. It, it means something to me. So I miss that very much. And it looks so cool, too, in my opinion. Say it was you know, it was different with the barbed wire all around it. So I like that. I like that a lot. So are you, are you like a are you like a bit of a, a like a belt geek in the sense that you like you know you know you you know the belts you like and the ones that you admired the most as a kid and even when you were in the business. Yes, yes, <laughs> I did a lot, and, but it's a weird thing to see things change. Like I, I remember when the spinners came out, and I kind of thought. <laughs> I was like, okay, John Cena, you got your spinner. But then after a while, it just grows on you. You just want to like play with that. <laughs> <Have it spin. laughs> did, did you feel the same with Edge's one where it was like, you just like had a black painted disc with an R in it? Oh my, uh, all these, I, I kept thinking, why are we keep, we're changing it all just to like fit everybody, which the idea is cool. But at the same time, that defeats the purpose, doesn't it? To... Mm to hold something that everybody's trying to covet commercial no. I, th I think it's a commercial move by wwe to sell more belts ah that's a, it's so heartbreaking that everything has to change like the whole the beauty of wrestling since the beginning it all has to change because of commercializing like okay i get the fact that we threw out like kind of like that playing with the r-rated stuff I get that, but at the same time, just because we're PG doesn't mean we keep it all clean. Like there's, you can't push the limits without having to offend parents. And, and because I mean, I remember when I was younger and I'd watch cartoons, I didn't know how racy that stuff was. You know, you mm. can push the limits without having kids realize what's going on. Ugh, don't and if they're watching wrestling, it's violent. So. Why are they watching wrestling? Don't get me even started on that one. Goodness me. It's like, oh, we've got to keep it clean for kids while well, this guy's smashing a chair over someone's head. It's like, what? Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll uh, I'll move on. We'll go uh, through your career. I'm sorry. Some of the questions I'm sure you've heard a million times before. Some of them, hopefully, not so much. Um, uh, very quickly, your inspirations for getting into wrestling. Are you going to say a uh, lady wrestler or valet? Or are you just going to say Steve Austin like everyone else? No. <laughs> It wasn't like a, there wasn't like a reason to go into wrestling that I, what I always tell people is there's always a different path. And I love hearing like unique and different paths to me when people say, oh, like I knew since I was a little kid and I'm like, really? Like you, you really didn't even contemplate about anything else. It's cute. Like, I love it, but it's kind of like you're missing out on all the ideas and the dreams and everything. But, but for me, I wanted to be a doctor. So it's weird. The path I took. And so I went to um, school, I went to trade school, I became a medical assistant, I had like this path of like, going to be a medical assistant, then be a nurse, and then get my foot in the door in this big um, 
um, out here it's Kaiser. So as I'm working there, then I could pay for medical school, all this stuff, I had a plan. And it's just one thing led to another. And yeah. so oh, there is sorry. a dog barking in the background. Don't worry about it. How are you guys? Yeah. Everybody who knows me knows that my dogs are always around. It's awful. Yeah. <laughs> it's awful. When, when, but, when, uh, when you started, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I, did you see yourself as just being a valet or were you always going to be a wrestler when you sort of signed no. up? No. When I first started, it, the whole plan was to be a wrestler. Never did I think I was going to be a manager. And it was like crazy to, I don't know, when they first told me, like, okay, you're going to manage your your boys. And I was like, what? Like, I'm going to be a manager? And they were telling me, no, there is, it's it's an art. And I kept thinking, no, that's what I see the girls who just stand there. I don't want to just stand there. That's not what I signed up for. It's like, why go through all this training just to stand there? And I I judged it poorly. Like, that was my perception of it. And that's wrong of me to think that because women did do more than that so everything i learned the skills i learned as a manager really blew my mind so it is an art form that seems like like i don't know if it gets taught the same way but it's a beautiful art where i sit there and i, I used to get yelled at a lot by mostly the girls like you just want to hang out with the guys no when they go over their matches I stand there and I go over the matches with them. I need to know what they're doing, where they're at, what the moves are, what I'm in the match. I have to know every little and I have to know the guys um, on the other side and the other team. I have to know everything, every single person's movements. Because if somebody gets hurt, if somebody forgets, I have to know where to go, what to do, what's next, to talk to the ref, all these beautiful details. And it's just like, to me, it helped me more when it comes to learning how to wrestle. Talk to me about uh, Tough Enough, because you train in San Bernardino, California, Jesse Hernandez School of Hard Knocks, before applying for the third season of Tough Enough. And I hadn't realized that you had applied for Tough Enough. So did you get through to Tough Enough through the school, or did you see an advert on TV? How do you apply? tv so then you go online and you submit everything and my my theory was that maybe if i got my foot in the door even if it's through this to get your foot in the door and be seen then you get a contract like hopefully that'll get me that much closer to getting a contract because at that point i was already going to different states like with all the rest of the wrestlers we'd go to different states wherever they would be near us and they only come to the west coast like once a year so there would be one season they'd come around the whole entire area so then we'd follow that and try to be seen so this was another way to be seen is by doing tough enough and apparently yeah. i wasn't dramatic enough for them <laughs> I, I wasn't um i didn't have any drama attached to me so i wasn't good tv <laughs> i am so glad you said that because someone who made it into the house did have a lot of drama attached to them it was a girl called lisa who may not have been her real name. Do you remember the story behind this person called Lisa who made it to the house? No, it's been so long. Was that during the time I tried out? or uh, I, No, she actually got to the was house. It... So I think she must have got to the whatever the final... Was it, was it a different season? Same season. And... Really? They cut her out of the show because apparently <gasps> she had a complete mental break with reality and kicked through a <gasps> wall in the house. I, I have to tell you all about this, right? So I'd, I'd never heard of this until today. She kicked through a wall of the house to where the production was hidden within the house, the Tough Enough house, uh, where the MTV production crew was. And then she was committed. And then when she escaped, she kept going to WWE shows and talking herself into the shows. For, oh, my goodness. Yeah. I, so you never heard that before? No, not really. But then, like, I'm sure the girls that, that did make it through I talked to, like, years later. I mean, I haven't talked to them in years but they were all so sweet. Like, you know, everybody has their, their quirks. But, I mean, I'm trying to think if it's one of the people that I, I'm thinking of. It's like, no, I hope that wasn't her. Because she, she was absolutely so sweet. Like, you never know. This is a thing, another thing that I find interesting about television actors or, like, wrestlers. Is there's so much, you know, talk when it comes to what happened behind the scenes. And this is what happened. Da, 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 da. But we never know what they are actually going through because instead of talking about it out loud in front of people, we want to like bury everything and pretend it didn't happen. And that makes it that much worse. Mm. But in scenarios like that, when it comes to 
uh, <laughs> so it's a reality show, but it's not real. They tell you to be bigger, dramatic, or cause dramas and all this stuff. Like it's not that's not really who they are, but it's a part that they're they're brought in to play for the cameras. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, what if the possibility is they pushed her to a point where she was she did get tired of it. She did break. I mean, for me, I feel like that happened kind of not, not, not to the point where I wasn't like, you know, when I got let go, I was like happy. I was like, OK, thank goodness. I get to relax. Didn't go back. But I think sometimes you get so much stress that it, it breaks you. It breaks you down and just you don't know what to do. I, for me, I was away from my family. I didn't have friends. All we had was each other. There's no emotional support. There's no no one having your back. You're being told that you have to attack each other because you need to be the best in this business. And that's the only way to do it. And that's not you know, what I signed up for. I wanted to be a dog. I wanted to help the world, you know, not like hurt anybody or be mad at anybody. I'm a person. Like, it's my family. And I had no family on the road. So it, it, that breaks you down and all sees is the character. So when it comes to these reality shows, all everybody sees their character and they believe they're that they are. And that it happens a lot, but no nobody ever talks about it. So I always wonder like that poor girl, I feel so bad for her. Maybe she played it up even more in hopes that she'd get a contract and it really wasn't like she was really crazy. Well I hope she wasn't really Sorry, crazy. I believe in the <laughs> I, I always I always have to believe that like no <laughs> it can't be like that <laughs> uh, when did you right so you get hooked up with OVW the next year um, and was there a process of getting accepted to OVW in the sense that you could st or you know had to go through WWE or whatnot or could you still like pay your money and get trained oh, hang on. oh there you go oh you, my goodness what you, happened it, you it, disappeared. all of a sudden it, it booted me out yeah Okay, you're back, you're back, you're back, you're back. Uh, did, did you get the question then? So OVW, when you get to OVW, is it the same process as like any other wrestling school where you can just pay your money and get there? Or did you have to go through like a vetting process through WWE because it was their feeder system promotion? Oh, no, because I got a contract with the WWE, I was automatically in. So there was no vetting or anything like that. Yeah, who knows? The, the vetting probably happened when it came to like going through the contracts and everything because, you know, the company does background searches and all this stuff. They want to make sure who they're hiring so that everything's done before you get to developmental. So when I got to OVW, it was amazing. Like, you know, I no offense, like EWF has grown now. So now it's like it's gotten bigger. So they have like a more of a bigger facility. But back in the day, <laughs> we were it was like a uh, garage. So we basically had a ring in a garage type of style. And like the ring was almost against the wall. One well, definitely on one side, there was a wall. And then on the other, you could barely squeeze through. So uh, it's to go from that with no air conditioning to going from OBW where they have like or like seat setups and they had the lights and everything was painted and you have banners and they you know, see the cameras, everything and everything. It was like, wow, damn, I'm getting paid to learn how to wrestle. Like anybody who complains, I'm like, look, you are getting paid to learn how to wrestle or to refine your skills. Cause there are people who they've already been in the business, right? There's people at that time, they were probably in the business way longer than I have when they got a contract. So, but for me, it was about learning more and refining all the stuff because, you know, I used to play sports and all this stuff. My coaches would always tell me that you have to practice good habits or else you, you know, bad habits will be second nature. So in OVW, Anytime they would tell me to switch things up, I would make it a point to learn because I want good habits to be second nature. So I, bad habits, when I look at bad form, I really pay attention to those things. And I try my best to be aware of that and be mindful. But it's it's an honor to be able to be at those facilities. So I one should never complain. They should take all that and use it to your advantage that somebody else, that they are supplying all of this for you. So it was a beautiful thing to see and to have the people who I've watched, you know, on TV teaching me. It was incredible. It was amazing. I, everybody would love to be in my position. <laughs> did, did, did you uh, did you get straight into Rip Rogers class straight away? Oh, my gosh. The, 
that that was like the main one so i think i think that's the way we all started for a while and then they switched him out and put in um lance and al and, and sometimes bill and yeah it was more for me even though i don't think i don't recall ever really <laughs> love rip but i feel like i learned from everybody else and his was more of like enduring like to know that i could survive it and when it comes to physicality like brutality of of going through drills um that was bills sometimes but it's not that and i need to make people aware for me and this is just for me bill demont was incredible because he just pushed us to our limit where it's like, okay, we're going to run as much as we can. We're going to do all this stuff. It's this physicality of let's see if we can endure this. So then when we're in a match, it's easy peasy. It's like nothing. I'm not winded. So his drills and the things we did with him was more like, it's just a blow up. It's to blow up. So then we could build our endurance. And whenever I start, like got through his classes, I felt like I was king of the world. You know, I just felt like I, I was badass. And I think that's why he always, it always seemed like he loved me because I, I, I never complained and I always thanked him. And I actually loved his classes because I was good at it. Did you, uh, uh, did you get more out of Lance or Al as a trainer then? Which was your favorite? Let's play favorites. Which is your favorite? Who do you think was the best oh, trainer? Oh, that's so sad. You know why? Because, Okay, so I think I was I spent more time with even though I was with um, Al on Tough Enough, but in OVW I spent more time with Lance. But it's like talking to Al, he sits there and he talks to you, and the way he explains things, he's like he's honestly like a dad, and he knows how to have the patience and the words to be able to explain things to everybody. And I love him so much for it because when he talks to he when he talks to me it's like it sinks in I understand I'm like wow well thank you for explaining that You're like yeah and then he jokes around and you know it just it just feels like you know family and I love him for that and then Lance he's very patient too he's really good when it comes to talking but it's not more so the psych like yes the psychology but say Al's like outside the ring and it's more like you know family friends and then Lance really is a good teacher like he's there to teach so it's everything strictly about what's happening within that ring and the whys of it all mm -hmm. and he's such he's so brilliant that I wish I spent more time with him because everything he had to say he also made so much sense too and I know I say that not that I say that a lot but I said that for Al and him but the thing is, is that not everybody can be that good of a teacher. And to me, the best I've I've seen was has been Fit, Al, and um, Lance. Like I love them so much. Fit's more of a show person; like he has to show you how to do stuff. Lance, great at explaining, and Al's like the in between. Is <laughs> the in between? That's that's the most finest diplomatic answer I've ever heard. They were all great for their own reasons. That, but that is a great answer. But it's true though. <laughs> With uh, with that being said, right, so this is 2004, you're in OVW. Now, this is, I don't know if there's going to be a controversial question according to you, but also in the year 2004 is the Diva Search. Now, uh, the Diva Search happens, and quite a few of them are signed, and I imagine sent to OVW for some training. <sighs> Did you find yourself, when you are OVW, uh, did you find yourself getting lumped in with the diva search types who had like no love for the business or no experience? No, see, this is a this is funny. I, like, it's interesting. I find everything interesting. So, uh, oh. not that I apologize, but I know people think it's weird. That's because I'm uh, boring, so it's fine by me. <laughs> offended by the diva search or the mention of it, like this is part of my history. This is part of what I was in and before the diva search happened we were called like women were called divas so it's it's not offensive to me it's just weird that it became that people turn it into something negative when in my mind it's like everybody's still to this day trying to be a diva so mm -hmm. in my mind it still works like they still wish that if the if you don't call the name the term with the diva the the um the energy the vibe still lives on 
So well, I'll, it's still... I'll, I'll be more specific then. So in 2004, you basically get a load of models in who are after a oh, quarter no. of a million dollar contract, whereas you're in it basically doing it the right way, you know, grassroots into training and then doing but, that way. But is... look, but look at the way I try to come in. I try to do the tough enough. So I don't fault anybody for coming in the way they came in. But I think that's completely and different, it, though. I think tough enough is completely different to Divas this, because, sorry. But, but this is the thing. If, say, I would think, like, okay, if they're saying that they, if their way is better or whatever, if they were trying to, like, downplay what the other people who took the other route did, then then I'd be offended, but no, they, they were always hardworking. It, they, they were, it hurts my heart because there was a lot of women who wanted to learn how to wrestle and they weren't given the opportunity because they had to stay on TV. And then there was also women who had the opportunity to learn to wrestle, but they didn't want to. But then I was like, okay, that I, I think that's heartbreaking where it's like, wow. Okay. Well, I wish I wish you would have done what everybody else did. But like, say, Ashley was, oh, my God, she wanted to learn so badly. She did everything that she could. Um, Layla did it. Um, Maria even did it like she I mean, she went and she's she's really great when it comes to learning the psychology and everything. So she went, she worked hard and everybody did do their part. So in my mind, I think I don't feel angry for that i love tori wilson i love stacy Kleebler. everybody has a purpose and to me it'd be boring if everybody's all wrestlers mm -hmm. so if we pepper in different varieties of people and different varieties of styles where it comes to at, um, levels there could be some people who they're not very physically capable of wrestling but they have great knowledge in it so we have different varieties of talent we just need to know how to utilize them and I didn't see it as a negative the way they came in because they were all willing to learn and they had different personalities to change up the storylines, to change up the characters. So I welcomed them and I didn't take offense to it because I came in, this is a thing, I was a person who everybody kind of shitted on because um, I was hired with two Playboy girls. So everybody thought I was a model. Nobody knew I was a wrestler. So everybody was on my case and I had to take, I originally had to take classes with the the girls because it was the beginner's class. And I was like, Oh my God, I already know how to do this stuff, but I did it anyway. And the sad part is it was, I was the only one doing the drills, doing the bumps. So I just saw it as another conditioning class. Like, okay, I'll do it. Even though I'm the only person in the ring doing it. I remember we did like drills with um, Billy Gunn and I took like hip tosses for 40 minutes. <laughs> But it was all because the other girls wouldn't do anything. And I was like, okay, well, I guess it's just me. And it was just like to see how high he could take, he could launch me. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> so was... It's kind of like, I get it. It's it kind of, what sucks is the way people treat you. And that's the sad part where it's like, why should I be treated any less? What if I was one of the Playboy girls? What if I was a model? And you're treating me like that, regardless of whether my background is or not. Now I see how you treat people. You treat people like this by judgment. And that's the sad thing to see when it comes to some of your peers. But it's okay. It made me a stronger person. It made me more aware of, like, I never want to treat somebody else like that. And it just... I don't know, it breaks my heart, but it is what it is. And it made me learn, okay, I got to tough up, toughen up a little bit and just be stronger. It's okay. It's a good thing that everybody thinks that you don't know how to wrestle because you surprise them every time you walk into the ring. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did. <laughs> with, the, with that being said, with Jim Cornette, uh, I know he was doing more of the TV stuff. Uh, was he hard on the women? Uh, coming in you know he, you know you just constantly pushing for more 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 that kind of thing you know I, no I don't that's not the way the memory of it was but I just remember everything his to me it was all brilliant and yeah he was like super when it came to like the sh day of the show he was like in you know he's in tv mode where it's like you got to get this done da, da, da. and in actuality it prepares you when you go live because once you go live it's 
even more of a strain for the fact that you cannot screw up when it comes to live. And if you do, you better know how to fix it without anybody knowing. There's, there's so no it, mistakes when we're live. What Was that the saying? What was it? What was Vince's saying? Oh, no, I don't even remember the, the, the sayings. Oh, it was something, did, did, did something I, like that. He said that? No, it was like uh, it, nothing can go wrong when it's live. Something like that. Oh. Well, it should. <laughs> you learn really quickly that you can't have anything. <laughs> and I love that. I love that. I love, I mean, if it's pre recorded, I like to treat it as if it's live because of that. You can't screw it up. And when somebody tells you, don't fuck up, it's like, thanks. <laughs> thanks for telling me that. Cheer it. Yeah, they always give you a big <laughs> thumbs up when they say it as well. So, yeah, cheers. Um, <laughs> When did WWE come calling? I mean, how, in fact, actually, how much notice were you given before uh, you knew that you're going to go to the main roster? Oh my goodness, I can't remember. Um, I, they gave us like this trial run of um, live events prior to our debut, but you kind of really don't know. Oh, I can't remember. Oh, I'm awful. Oh. I think the guys have. Better than on than that, but it just seemed like okay, it was expected. You just wait, and I mean, we did the same routines in OVW, of, like workout, or, um, go train. So train at OVW, work out at a gym, get ready for shows um, on Wednesdays, then weekend shows. So it's the same routine. So when it came to like going up for um, TV, it's like okay. So instead of going like driving to whatever show we were going to drive to with for OVW, we just go to the airport and we'll go there. So. The time's all carved out. Nothing's too stressful other than, okay, let's get our best stuff. Um, let's get our, our look and our minds in sync so then we can do what, what Eminem need to, do what Eminem needs to do. <laughs> Tell me about, actually, because Eminem was actually in OVW first, wasn't it? So it was you, Joey, and Johnny. And was the tag team or the team, as it were, with you included... <laughs> Was that all totally fleshed out in OVW, or is it when you went to WWE they started adding things? Uh, and when was sort of like the finished package, basically? Oh my goodness, I think I feel like it was always a work in progress. But we basically had our whole thing together in OVW. We just were who we were, and for me, because I came in with Playboy Girls, because I came from California, um, because everyone thought I was a model, or whatever. Everyone kept calling me like like. They kept calling me like Cali and all this stuff. And so in my mind, I thought, gosh, like in my mind, I saw myself as more of a fighter and this and that perception is reality. So I understood that, wow, how I see myself isn't exactly the way people see me. So if I'm going to be the model chick, if I'm going to be the Cali girl. Well, let's give them what they see, and especially since John was from um, California. We figured, OK, let's do that let's be these hollywood kids and then we got joey to come in which um cornette thank goodness for cornette brought him to us because suggested him and he completed the team because he was actually the foundation like he's the heart of the team uh i just feel like he's the one who makes the common sense calls and is is the one that understands where we need to go in position john's the the crazy who knows what's going to happen and he's always off the wall ideas and me i'm just the one that kind of like glues it together and adds to it or the pretty bow on top and okay. it was learning from them is amazing too uh having said that who came up with the coats who came up with the rolling out the carpet and the photographers so who who gets the credit for coming up with these uh additions to the character i, I want to think i want to think it was john for the coats and joey for the red carpet I, that's that's what I want to say, because I remember going down like Melrose with John and he was trying on for coats and I was like, it's too hot to put that on. Why are you putting it on? He's like, no, it's to take back to OVW. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the big one that uh, you know, as I said before, we got we got a lot of questions in and a lot of them are just like, I oh, forget it. <laughs> but uh, one of many of the questions were, who came up with the idea for the splits? <laughs> well, well I'd, I'd weird... figure it was you because you know you could do it. It's basically, you and Rob <laughs> Van Dam. 
it's this weird thing where it's like, I know I could do it, but it, I never thought like, oh, I'm going to do it as my entrance. It was never a plan to take over like the entrances of wrestling or anything like that. I really had no idea I, of what what was going to happen in the future by doing the splits. But I just know that the guys, again, at OVW, the guys said, okay, Melina, look, when we go out there, you need to come up with a good entrance. And they're showing me like videos of what girls have done. It's like, you could do this and this and that. Or how about stroke the ropes, be sexy, stroke the ropes and just touch it. And they're showing me all this stuff and I'm watching them thinking, oh my God, these guys trying to be sexy in front of me. (laughs) I was like, it's not working. (laughs) And then I just thought, okay, well, how about this? And I just dropped and went under and they're like, that's it, do that. And I was like, okay, yeah? And they're like, yes, please do that. That is, that's going to work. And then when Cornette saw it, they're like, oh my goodness. He's like, what did I just see? <laughs> was, there, was there anyone in WWE who was like, I know it wasn't PG at the time, but was there anybody in WWE who was like, that's risque, that's maybe a bit too sexy for the TV shows? Or were they just like more, more, more at that time? Nobody said anything. And, and like, I'm such a... I guess it never occurred to me until I started seeing it, of course, in OVW, but then more so when it came to the main roster that it, for me, it was just like, what did I get myself into when it came to doing the splits and the skirts? Because now not only can like a bigger stage is like, so thank goodness on TV, they cut away to the front angle, but still there's people taking pictures behind you. And it's like, what did I just do to myself? Like, why did I just do this? Oh my goodness. But Everybody, like the company always protected the camera angles and everything. And, you know, they never shot pictures from that angle. Or any- I think they may be once. I'm not sure. But really, they were really respectful for me in those cases, I feel like. I don't know about anything else, but I remember like they really were, they were really great with me when it came to the entrance. Uh, just and nobody to- said anything except like people who hated me, where they're like, oh, bitch. <laughs> I'm like, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, just because you can't do it. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> um, just uh, for TV, damn it! <laughs> I want to ask. I want to ask a fairly serious question. That might actually. I don't know if I have a long answer or a short answer. And obviously, I know uh, uh, you dated Johnny Nitro, John Hennigan, for many years. <laughs> I, I always felt that you know you just look at the dude and you think that. I mean, <laughs> it maybe wasn't like fantastic like the interviews, but like for everything else, he seems to be the total package. I mean, he looked like a god that dude and he still looks great how come no companies like ever like fully got behind him like as like a main event star kind of thing because it's like wwe would do it for a bit and then they pull back and the same thing i don't get it i don't know i always feel like um when it comes to uh, certain companies i mean you could work with the person as much as you can with ideas and everything and i guess if uh, a talent has ideas and then a company has ideas and they're not seeing on the same eye to eye level, like they're not on the same page. It just, they feel like they kind of give up because they're not seeing each other's perspective. And maybe that could be the case um, that what the company would want and what the talent envisions just doesn't match up. And then they, they think, okay, kind of like relationship where, you know, we're just not, see- we're not seeing eye to eye and we, maybe we should just call it quits type deal. Mm. I have no idea, but I do think that, if it was up to me, the way people are written when it comes to talent, like writing um, storylines and everything, if you watch them, you see what they're capable of. You see what their character is. Why not start there instead of trying to take a person and change them into something they're not? What were they trying to change Johnny into then? I have no idea. I really don't know. I kind of feel like I have no concept. And maybe that was the problem. Like, we have no concept of what they want and we try to ask or it just doesn't come across when when you ask sometimes like i hear people sometimes and they have great stories of yeah i had a great relationship and they explained everything to me and you know we had we were able to talk every week and i'm thinking that's not every person that that's not the case for everybody when it comes to storylines and their position in the company sometimes it's just difficult to talk to them so I'm not sure John's relationship because I wasn't like always around him all the time. So maybe he did have conversations. He was always proactive. But I just think, how can you not have, how can you not write a story for a person like him? 
Uh, so but you, then a lot you... of people during that era, there's a lot of people during that era they missed the boat on too. And it's that's kind of why I don't watch a lot of wrestling because you see the talent and you know they're not doing what they should with each individual. Mm. And it's frustrating. If I look back during my era, it's like the crazy storylines and like great talent, which they put out there, but they didn't do anything with. So people want to get behind them, but they couldn't because you just threw them out there to do a couple of tag teams and then nothing. And so sad. So did you uh, never, uh, you or Johnny, never really try and be political in the sense of, you know, ingratio- ingratiate yourself into the office, you know, go to the agents more or even, you know, more of the office like that to sort of push ideas for yourselves? I think he did. He was more, he was more proactive. He was really um, good at interacting. So that's why I don't know, because I was always such an introvert. I didn't know how to do that. And I felt like, okay, in my mind, it was about the work. Like, well, if I work hard and, you know, my mind, I didn't know at that time. I was very, my understanding was different because I was very sheltered or naive. That's what it was. I was very naive. So my understanding back then was like, well, it's the hard work. It's they see what I did and I get rewarded by since they know what I do, what I'm capable of. They give me title runs. They have me work with different people because they know I could get the job done and it's an honor. So in my mind, I thought, okay, like they see. So that was my mentality then. But for him, he was, he was proactive in, in conversation, but I was never good at it. I was like, oh, I'll just be out in the stands. <laughs> yeah, I, I fully understand. Don't worry. Uh, we're going to move on a bit now. Um, first piece of merchandise uh, that ever Oof. featured you. Oh, my goodness. I can't hear. Was that the T-shirt? Oh, wait, no, that one didn't feature me, but it was just Eminem. Oh, maybe oh. the DVD. One of the DVDs, like, for, um, I think it was, like, Divas in cancun or something or divas do mexico something like that where we were at a beach mm. i wasn't on tv yet but they had me do it and so by the time i came out i think eminem barely came out or something so it was just like the timing was perfect but it was just so awkward i look at my videos now and i think uh you can see like my baby boys and everything <laughs> mm-hmm. well i was going to ask because you just said you're an introvert there as well and then it's like right introvert Get in a bikini and stand out there for four hours and get photographed. Like, could you could you ever get over that kind of thing? Uh, yes and no. So, like, I, you learn. That's like that's kind of like a now I know how to socialize, so I'm better with talking. Before, I didn't know how to talk. I didn't know how to speak my mind. Um, I didn't know how to 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 talk to people when it came to things. So that's why another reason where I thought, well, I don't blame people for hating me. I didn't really talk (laughs) i just listened so in my mind the way i you know grew up was i would listen to people and then try to find common commonalities and then try to join in on things that i knew okay i understand this maybe i'll start talking about this or people would realize oh she's here wanting to be a part of the group and then they'll like invite me in that never happened (laughs) like it all went wonky and i never fit in so i never had my i never could find a spot to go to find a like a place in wrestling in but I learned these are the things where even like photo shoots and all that stuff it's you know they're they're not my best work but at the same time these are the steps to take to learn how to pose and learn how to be comfortable in your own skin and learn how to be more you know have fun with people on a beach like this is the first time I'm outside away from my family like enjoy the beach melina <laughs> and i did it's these are all learning lessons and scary and crazy and weird at first but you learn the more practice you get i'll uh, i'll shift off this in a second but i was going to ask this later on but it sort of like feeds into this now is were you ever offered uh, to do playboy uh, yeah were you really <laughs> So when so when i'm doing those promos and stuff saying like they asked me and blah 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 it's the truth <laughs> and i couldn't like i there's nothing wrong with doing it. it. It's just my mentality back then, especially was, well, the main reason is the latter one that I'm going to say, but when I got into wrestling, I got into wrestling and it does change just how people perceive you when you do certain things. So it's not to say like, Oh, you know, I look down on people who do it. It's the knowing of how it'll affect you in the future. Cause I've signed with the girls when they like, they're, they're signing their 
um, doing autograph, like regular autograph signings is somebody slaps a Playboy right in front of them. And that look of frustration, like, really, you're going to just slap that on there. And I think it's more of like my kids or something. And I like I would see that and think, yeah, I really got to think this completely through. My mom would tell me if they're paying you a good amount of money, you should do it. <laughs> Is there, oh, mom. And in my heart, the reason I didn't want to do it was I didn't want somebody to come into my my dad's music store and put that magazine in my dad's face or my brother or to have like whoever I'm dating, like the way I saw it at that time before all this craziness of the internet and all this stuff happened is I don't want the person I'm dating that I love to see, have other guys see me naked. Mm. He's the only one who's going to see me naked. And that's another big thing too. So all these factors, it was like, uh, I don't, I don't really want to do it. You, like you, it's not you, like, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, did uh, did Playboy at least like? I, I assume they gave you uh, money offer. Would it have been worth it for a certain amount for you? Or, or, or I, I won't ask the number, but what did you turn down roughly? Maybe. Oh, I have no idea. Basically, it would just be um, Johnny telling me. He'd just be telling me, "Okay, Marina, like you know, uh, they're asking again." And I'm like, I, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't. Bl- I honestly, yeah, I honestly don't blame you. I, huh? I honestly don't blame you because, it, like, it's the whole toothpaste back in the tube, and with the internet and everything, everything lives forever now. So, what yeah, seems like a good but... idea one year may not be a good idea the next year. And it's already as it is. Like nobody, like for a long time, people couldn't see the person behind the splits. Like all people saw was the splits, and there's no person behind it. There's no individual, no human. Like I had no feelings and it's like i have feelings i'm more than just that like thank you for appreciating it but i'm a person <laughs> uh i'm gonna ask one more m&m thing and then we'll move on uh joey Merc. I, I really like joey as well uh nose love- breaking in the ladder match tell me all that you remember from that night it was this was like armageddon oh. 2006 tell me about it Oh my goodness, there's no forgetting it. And a lot of people bring that up too. I was, oh, it, it scared the crap out of me for the fact that he's the safe one. He's the one who always like plays by the rules, make sure everyone's safe and nothing is like, he's the one that has, makes the calls that are completely sane. And John is the crazy one that does the death defying stuff. That's like, okay, somebody, he's going to get hurt one day. Thank goodness he hasn't. But he was the one I was scared of. Joey, never, because he's always in control. So to see that and the way it was done and then the gash, like, and he's so brilliant when it comes to camera angles, because if you're going to get cut open, find a camera. (laughs) And he did it. And, you know, most people would scrunch their face and lean down and like hold their face he held his head up high and let the world see it. i was like oh my goodness that's tough because you know it hurts you know you don't want to like do that position and he's just amazing he's an amazing person and honestly the scar looks cool now if you see it <laughs> <laughs> but then i was crying i was right in gorilla watching the monitor because they wouldn't let me go out and i was here i was there saying what why nothing's gonna happen to me i'm i'd be safe like i'm just gonna be in the aisle and then when that happened it's like they looked at me like that's the reason why i'm Lena. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, Joey. what exactly oh, went wrong with it though was it just like a slight misbalancing of the ladder or was his head like slightly oh off skew with I what never... went wrong I never asked what the the move actually was supposed to be. All that I know is that teeter totter thing went wrong because I, I mean, I, I, you got to factor in like adrenaline and what the person's thinking about the next move, but the ladder was hit on one side and it just plopped. And maybe he wasn't ready. Maybe the timing was was off. Who knows? Only he would know. But. Yeah, I, I didn't even ask. All I cared about was, are you okay? Are you okay? Because we went as soon as the show ended, or as soon as John got out, we drove to the hospital. Yeah, there was um, I, I mean, it's a bit of a sad ending because this sort of like hastens the end of Eminem, doesn't it? A couple of months later, because well, there the are reasons why it hastens the end, mm-hmm. of, but it's because of the it was because of the injury, I believe, wasn't it? 
I, I just wonder about that. Actually, somebody brought that up and I thought, I, I don't know why sometimes I just, everything that's going on, I don't think things through. And it made me realize, holy cow, it probably was the, you know, the pain. It, that's where the, like he started having a lot of pain yeah. because of his face. So maybe that's where it did start. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> a couple of months, a uh, couple of months, a couple of weeks ago, excuse me, you wrote a, a, a blog uh, and it was apparently you gave like uh, some interview on YouTube something and something came out wrong something about Trish Stratus. I don't I didn't actually watch the video. I read I, <laughs> I, I, I read I read what you said afterwards. So it's sort of the videos and materials this, and it just says it's tough to have a conversation when you don't love what everyone else loves or in the way they love it or else you'll be hated. Funny thing is I've always been hated in wrestling, so I'm okay with this, which seems very unfair uh, to yourself. <laughs> But um, so was it? Was True. it? Yeah. Was it just something like you didn't give Trish enough props, or you didn't give Sable enough props, or something like that, and it just got misconstrued? Oh, no. But see, like with Sable, I only said one thing, and everybody like people loved it, which is the reality. Like Sable was nice. I mean, she was so sweet that I reminded her of her niece or something like that. She thought I was Hawaiian, and I was like, oh, she was just a sweetheart. So it just weirded me out that people would say negative things about her. And granted. You know, sometimes people treat everybody differently. So I can't say for everybody else, but she was nice to me. Mm. So that's all I know. And when it came to Trish, I just like, because they asked me about um, her return. And in my mind, I'm thinking she came back again. Like, it's not really a return to me. She's basically like, you know, when John Cena would come back and then he'd get hurt or he'd take like leave and then come back. So basically in my mind, she's on the roster. So it she just takes little vacations yeah. and and in my mind and it didn't come out the way i was thinking in my head and that's a learning lesson for me to be more conscious be more aware of the things i say be more aware if i'm tired or dehydrated or hungry but when i start doing interviews like i need to be mindful of everything and it's a learning lesson for me i love her and for people not to know that and to to, to tear that apart and to cause this is, this is another thing. If it causes tension when it comes to people I love, it's like, why would you guys do that? Just because I didn't say exactly what you wanted me to hear. Mm -hmm. And I can't apologize for that because my favorite wrestlers were different from yours. And that's why they're my favorite wrestlers, not yours. But I love everybody, respect everybody, and thank everybody for their contributions. And especially when it comes to working with me because they took the time and patience with me. But when it came to that moment of um, that interview, yeah, I just said the, I just worded things wrong. I just phrased it wrong, but I just didn't, didn't mean to offend. It's not to say like somebody was awful. Not, no, not in any way. I've never said that. It's it just hell. wasn't, it wasn't the praise that people wanted. Yeah. Th th and for me, it's like Charlotte gets a lot of crap, which I think she's an incredible wrestler. It's all these things where am I going to get hate because I love Charlotte? Am I going to get hate because I love, love certain people and I wish they would get more props? Like, you know, you see Natalia, she's busting her ass. And I think like, wow, so I think I heard, saw somebody like somebody slap Natalia again. And I was like, again, why is she always getting slapped? Like Natalia should be doing the slapping. Yeah. And there's moments where. That's just my opinion. It doesn't mean it's fact, but it doesn't mean you should join on, on board and that I'll hate you if you don't agree with me. And I even tell fans too, I said, uh, not fans, people who say, well, you're so sweet. And, you know, I like you as a person, but I I think this person's my favorite. And I said, you want know, to love that person. I don't mind. Everybody has their favorites. And as long as we're cool with each other, I'll still love you either way, whether you're a fan or not. Yeah. I love you as a person. That means more to me. It's, it's wrestling. People fall out with you over anything over wrestling. Let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> this sort of <laughs> tell me about it. Oh, tell me about. It. Listen, uh, I'm actually. This is actually going to go to uh, the next thing. I remember back in the day. So I was, you know, uh, a dorky kid looking up the wrestling news every day, almost days, you know, on WrestleZone and whatever it was. I remember, I don't know where this was, if it was in this book or if it was on an online blog or a website or something like that, and I remember Mick Foley really publicly sticking up for you quite a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, she, you know, he, he would wax lyrical about you and just say, look, she's like the best women's wrestler on the roster by far, and other things yeah. that were just great. And, and then at some point, you end up 
on an on-screen sort of, not a relationship, but like uh, you do quite a lot of vignettes together, like in mid-2006. Uh, talk about your relationship with Mick and why is he such a big fan of you? Oh my goodness. Like he actually, which is such a huge compliment. Like everybody across the board, whoever watched and praised me, like uh, when I hear like Booker T, when I hear Bret Hart, when I hear Mick, it means so much. Even Jim Cornette, when he, everything he sees, it's like, it means so much to me because not only have they seen wrestling, but I suspended belief for them. You know, when it came to Mick, when I first met him, like I, I looked at him, I was like, oh my goodness, you, we were all going to a talent meeting and he was right there, like right in front of the door, but also in the middle of the hall. And I saw him, I, I was like, oh my goodness, you're Mick Foley. And then I said, it's great to meet you. And I shook his hand and then he said, you're so sweet. <laughs> and I was like, what? What was he expecting? <laughs> and he said, no offense, but <laughs> he said from watching me on TV, he really thought I was going to have like this crazy attitude and be a bitch. He's like, um, excuse the word bitch. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't take offense to it. And I said, oh my goodness, that's such an honor. Like, I was just like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and I think because he saw the person that I was and because I guess I was nice that he just wanted to help me that much more. Like, okay, well, let's, let's help you on that acting like a bitch that much more by mm. creating this storyline with you. And oh, so, so, he so he actually pitched it then. Of course, they like altered it and they switched it, but but it's like that was his that was his idea. Yeah, because um, he wanted to help. He wanted to turn me into the into the most hated heel. So that was the intention for that. And oh my goodness, I I legit I was crying for reals that day when he kissed um, Vince's ass. Like that was real tears because I knew I knew he was actually he really was kissing his ass for me. And and it's like, Mick, you crazy, <laughs> you crazy. <laughs> and then when I had to like do the low blow, and I I, I couldn't even, I wanted to cry, but I had to like get out of that. But he, that was like the biggest honor. He is such a good guy, and to believe in the character and everything that I was doing meant so much. And I just wish I could have given him more. Like I wish I could have done more with that character to further what he he gave to me, but. I don't know. I just, all I'm happy about more than anything is him as a person and all the good talks and everything and the friendship after. Okay, right, Melina. Now, I have uh, the first of a couple of games. If we get to the second game, great, but this is the uh, uh, main one that I like, name association. And oh. I'm essentially going to give you a sentence, and you tell me the first name that comes to your mind that matches that uh, description that I give you. First one is funniest person in the locker room. What is Santino? <laughs> See, that's a good that's a good time when you just say their name and laugh. So you know they're funny. <laughs> uh, next one is last man standing at the bar. I don't know if you're a big drinker back in the day or if you'd know this. Oh my goodness. Oh I go off of I go off of the last memories and uh, Mike Knox. <laughs> yeah, okay. He's a boy. I just like picture him. I picture them and be like, "Hey." <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, "Where's where's my where's my phone?" <laughs> um, and he's like, right here. <laughs> right here. Next one is the cuz normally normally when I talk it's uh, guys I interview, so I'm going to do the opposite for you. The best looking male wrestler in real life. Well, I kind of, that's, uh, my perception of things, everybody's going to hate it, but I'm surrounded by a lot of good looking dudes. And then plus they all act like my brother. So it's kind of like, I, that kind of takes away like, okay, they look good, but then they act like my brother. Yeah. They're like fighting <laughs> in the face, that kind of thing. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in my mind, I'm like, well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I mean, they all look good. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll give you the one. I'll give you the one I asked the guys. Then the most beautiful uh, lady in real life, not on television. Oh my goodness! Well, now I'm thinking like, well, all the girls are beautiful. <laughs> like, I'm, really gonna... I'm uh, asking you to be not diplomatic, but you're welcome to be diplomatic. I love and I'll them move all. on. <laughs> There's I'll... a lot of hot girls. <laughs> I'll move on. I'll move on. I'll move on. Uh, this is a uh, this is a more serious one. Biggest bully. 
I guess bully. I am the worst. You're gonna hate me. Um, I mean, pass. <laughs> We're not getting many here. Okay. Give me heat. <laughs> Biggest river. I already got enough of it. <laughs> Go on, best river. Biggest river. Oh, I guess for me it was always Joey because Joey was always ripping me. Mm. Oh. Any good ones? Any good rips? Uh, well, like knocking on the knocking on my own hotel door and having water thrown in my face. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Joey, good one. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> smelliest, smelliest wrestler. I would say M and M for the fact that like those coats, whenever they'd sweat in it, because they need to wash it, dang damn it, more often every week, you guys. Just like your knee pads every week. Yeah, was it? Uh, was it also the same because you're wearing like all the oil on the bodies as well, and that would transfer into the coats. And then because it's like summer, some places it's like summertime. They're wearing coats. They're sweating in it, so they take off their coats and they wrap me in it. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Evil, evil. <laughs> Best and worst celebrities you met through WWE. So, like, it could have been like celebrity GMs or something like that. Terrible. I usually pass through by and just go, go straight to the ring and back. But everybody's been nice to me. It's so weird. It's like everybody's been nice to me, but in wrestling, that was like a different thing. <laughs> But everybody who came in, I was like, oh, you're so nice. But maybe because they're guests, I don't know, but everybody's been nice to me. Uh, no one has an answer for this, so you probably won't. Well, quite a few people do, but most people <laughs> Biggest stooge for the dirt sheets. Oh, God, I stayed out of all that stuff. I'll move on then, I'll move on. Uh, most... Oh, I'm the first person you've had here, huh? No, no, no don't <laughs> worry, don't worry, don't worry. There's plenty, don't worry. <laughs> uh, most in trouble with the office. <laughs> not with the office but i don't know but can i stay out of all this stuff okay well here's one you will know um mm -hmm. stiffest jillian really <laughs> those forearms will get you <laughs> uh, i love them though i love them jillian you could go ahead and stiff me anytime i don't care <laughs> that's the spirit <laughs> which she did <laughs> I'd have black eyes from her. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> well, at least you knew. At least you earned your money then. Um, this is sort of like a spin-off of that. The clumsiest or the uh, lady wrestler with two left feet. Oh my goodness, I would think me, but then I remember um, Melina always saying that she, like she was, but I never saw her like fall or anything. So usually I'm the one because I fell off the the. The entrance on pay per view. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, uh, it's not I have two left feet. It's just like I don't pay attention. <laughs> next one is the nicest person in wrestling. Oh, who's who's the most huggable? For me, it's Alicia Fox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, she's huggable. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Uh, <laughs> biggest. Pothead. Oh, well, the first thing I think of is Snoop, but <laughs> RVD? Yeah, yeah. Fine answer. RVD, Sabu, the usual ones. Um, Not the RVD! <laughs> the, uh, your favourite match stipulation to work? My goodness. All I can remember is, well, God, it's like I love the false count anywhere, but I wish I could take the I Quit match and then do another, like a reboot of it or something, like something more, something else, something where, you know, we're not told that what we can and cannot do. Mm. Uh, most memorable thing you ever saw happen on an aeroplane? On it, oh, I guess for me, um, one of the things I love a lot was, uh, I thought it was like the saddest thing. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm flying on a plane on the 4th of July. Like, this sucks. And I looked out the window and to see all the fireworks, they're so tiny. But when you see all of them just start exploding every which way, it's kind of like, you know, it's not happening at the same time, but it is. 
And then at all different times as well, like it's nonstop fireworks just setting off out in the distance. And it's such a gorgeous look that I always wanted to go back on, on 4th of July to go see the, you know, the sky as it's, all the fireworks start shooting off. Uh, this is quite similar. Most memorable thing that you saw happen in a bar. Oh my goodness. It, uh, I have no idea. Okay, I'll move on. <laughs> I was drinking too. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen two of everything. You should have known. <laughs> uh, oh, every every time we go to the bar, it's always a good time. Like, <laughs> uh, Biggest Debbie Downer in the locker room. Always had like an eel, the donkey face. Never cheered up. It was probably me too. <laughs> oh, God. Go on, well, let, let's, leave, let's leave you out of this one. Anyone else? I can't remember because I never paid attention to stuff. I just like focused on my own thing. I can't, and everybody seems to be having a great time. Can't recall anybody having a donkey face. Okay, uh, I'll move on. Uh, most talented women's remember. wrestler. Most talented oh. women's wrestler you ever wrestled. Oh, oh man. It's this thing where it's like, you want me, I have to pick one? Oh, yeah. Well, you can give us a top three if you like. Maybe, I think maybe um, Gail Kim. Gail Kim. Like, I wish I had more um, matches with her. She had a creative brain and, like, a, a great mind for wrestling and also can actually execute the moves. Like, she was fast and nimble. And I just, I love her mind for wrestling. And I know there's other people, so everybody don't get mad at me. I love you. You're great too. I get put on the spot. You know how I get. I know, I know, but that that's you knew it was you knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. Uh favorite country to work in. Oh my goodness. The UK. Stop it. <laughs> but I mean it's it true be. though. It's true though. It's like the UK, Canada, Puerto Rico. Um, it's because these countries, like we don't ever go to like WWE doesn't go there often because the united states it's like we're here at least twice like in each city the, each city twice a year at least so it's people are used to it here so it's like they're loud they're vibrant but not to the extent of like when we go overseas and insane it's such oh to take in that the sound of it all and that energy Oh my goodness, it's beautiful. Mm. And Italy too. Like, oh my goodness. It's just you guys are so appreciative and it's that's it makes it worth it. It makes it worth it. Definitely. Uh well, the uh, yeah, the 12-hour flights <laughs> make it worth I it. TV. Walk around, watch TV, take a little nap. Oh right, so you can sleep on planes and I can't. My I I've said this before, my longest flight ever was 26 hours. Couldn't get a wink of sleep on it. Oh. Oh, what I do is I always have to get a window. And it's not that I really get sleep. It's just at least I could like lean against the the, the wall and then just close my eyes. Because at least that's something. Mm. I'm a I'm a stomach sleeper, so I can't really sleep. Oh, I'm uh you see for me it's drugs and alcohol. And for some reason that doesn't work so <laughs> anymore. I think I'm I'm immune to it now. Uh I've only got a couple more, <laughs> then we'll move on. Um do 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 best travel companion oh well what comes to mind is Zelina so she for me before she got into the WWE she was my best travel companion I miss her so much worst, now that she's I'm, <laughs> worst driver miss, Julian <laughs> stiffest worst driver got you uh, he tells me she's the best I'm like Julian you scare the crap out of me <laughs> 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 See, a lot of people have got this answer: is loudest spot caller. Oh, oh my goodness! No, we don't have that. If anything, everybody's like undershooting, where it's like, "What? Huh? What did you say?" <laughs> so you're never in a match with John Cena, then? <laughs> is he the people say he is? Everyone says John Cena. What kills me is when I see it on screen and you could see them like actually like, hey, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh, why'd you do that? <laughs> um, I'm going to give you one more. 
most memorable backstage fight, if there ever was one that you saw? Like a real one? Yeah. They're not the ones I like to see. <laughs> I guess, like, I remember um, there was a, there was a, what was it? I think it was an overseas trip, and they were trying to, it was like a wrestler's court type of deal, and they were trying to get, uh, I forgot, it was one of the tag teams. They were trying to get them to fight each other until it finally happened, and then there was blood drawn, and I was like, oh, my God, what the hell is going on here? And that's the one of the um, fights that I remember. I can't remember. So much crazy happened. <laughs> but it was one of those things where it's like, why am I witnessing people trying to make other people fight against their will? And they just want to go to sleep. Like, it was the most insane thing. I remember we had to get the doctor to slip up sti um, stitches on a person's face because of it. And I was like, oh, my God, what are we doing here? And I'm just sitting here watching. Like, I felt like such a douchey person. <laughs> like, I can't do anything. I want to stop it. I want to help, but I can't. What year was this? I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think what tag team it could have been. Mm, I want to say it was after... I want to say it was after Eminem. So I was, it was just me and John, I think, on Raw. Mm, so that would have been, what, 2006 or seven or something? Damn. I think six or seven, yeah. That doesn't narrow it down. The... It narrows it down a bit. I'm trying to think what tag teams there, like London and Kendrick or something? No. Oh, not that it would make a difference. Nobody should have to go through that. No. But I was like... But, you know, I love Brian, so I'm like, no, I never want to go to that. <laughs> well, there you go, fan. So, you know, if, someone's, if you can if you can figure out who that was, please send it in, because I'd love to know who it was as well. Okay, that's the end of that game. We're going to ask you some more questions, and then we'll do a game at the end, and then we'll uh, shut this down. Um, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Worst uh, player ever. I'm sorry. No, you, you gave half answers. Well, you gave answers to half the questions. You, you gave yourself as an answer to quite a few of them, for goodness sake. <laughs> Um, I threw myself less a lot. <laughs> do you know, uh, just because you mentioned you managing Johnny after Eminem split up, how come you stopped managing him after a short while? Was that like a call between you two? Was that a call of the office? Or why did that sort of... Uh... I mean, my recollection, I thought, was because he moved to ECW. But I guess they did have me wrestling um, before that. So it's because the company wanted me to wrestle instead of manage. So then... And, they, and I think they probably thought that if he, they took... if I moved away from him he'd like step up a little bit more mm. but it mean you know it was a good package and everything like that did you fight your corner on that or was it just like no. fine well i don't recall um i don't know on his part but it's, it's one of those things where you kind of feel like well they know better right so you kind of trust them i don't know that's the way i felt was like okay well if that's what you feel because sometimes i think i guess my fear was if i fought some for something then that would make them want to shut it down that much more or that would give them a reason to say, cause I'm already having heat and in my mind, well, not in the company, like not with the higher ups, but it's like anything I'm treading so lightly and walking on eggshells that I don't want to give anybody any reason to say that I'm going against them. So I kind of felt like, okay, I'm not going to fight on this. There was a lot of battles like that where it's like, um, I can't like, you can't say anything cause that fear of, Will I get fired if I say anything? Hmm. If, uh, that's just the way. Would it, would it doesn't. It, I'm sorry. I was. I'm sorry. I was talking over you. Then. Uh, do you want to say that again? Because I, I totally muted it's your. Just, it's just the way I felt. That doesn't mean that's fact. Because hmm. you know, I'll never really know if, if that'd be true or not. Would you? Uh, would you've ever had that kind of relationship with like Johnny, uh, Johnny Ace, John Laurinaitis to go up and say? anything basically uh as far as like your match goes or your direction goes or anything or was it just not not for you to, to talk to him like that oh yeah like i'd ask him questions but it's this thing where you start realizing that they kind of tell you what you a little bit of what you want to hear and a little bit of like enough but not the whole story so you start learning that okay you're really never going to tell me what i need to hear and that's not the the lip service what i need to hear is the facts the truth what is going on and you know for me just reached that point where i started realizing okay i'm never gonna get any of my questions answered not truly so i just stopped with the but then at some like i'm gonna say ask again 
just to see if they'll say the same answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Do you know, with that being said, actually, did you ever do that thing where, I mean, I'm sure everyone did at one point or another, stand in line to talk to Vince at TV. Did you ever, like, do you ever, like, hang about in line for two hours to air a grievance or something like that with Vince McMahon? Because oh. <laughs> no. uh, I, I guess, I don't know. I just, I don't know why. I just, in my mind, I thought, well, why would we do that? Like, why would we, I mean... I don't know. It just seemed weird to do that. Yeah. I've never worked anywhere where it had like wait in line for, to, for like to talk to my boss and all this stuff. You know, like if anything, hey, like maybe make appointments. But it's just this thing where they enjoy watching us be in line. <laughs> so, yeah, so in my mind, it's like okay, well, I got my storyline and I know what I need to do and I need to prepare for that and focus on that. And to me, it was always about what they told me taking that and making the best of it or doing the best thing I can with whatever they gave me. And it just, I, I guess it's because I hear everybody else and everybody's always pitching storylines every week, every week. And not everybody, maybe some of the people like a percentage of all those people who are waiting in line, maybe 1%, maybe get their stories fulfilled and done on TV. It actually happens. But for the rest of them, you hear so many stories around the ring, around the uh, um, in the stands, or when we wait in the catering. Everybody's saying like how they kind of get screwed over. And in my mind, I thought, well, why am I going to waste my time standing in line just so that I could be one of those people who say, "Oh, they screwed me over again." Um, I'd rather just focus on my work, and that's it. Be happy with what I have yeah. and make the best out of it. You can, Not that I'm saying what people should do. It's just that's what my mentality was back then. Uh, you can you can tell me to just skip, and I'll be more than happy to because this is one of like the couple of controversial questions, right? Last year, Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis, non disclosure agreements and such, and this apparently this activity, this behavior was going on from. <laughs> allegedly from the 80s all the way to the 2020s, this kind of thing. Was this something that became a massive surprise to you when all these revelations were made public? Or did you have an inkling this was going on with Vince and maybe a couple of the other higher-ups? See, I... Okay, again, again, just to make clear, I have always was so traumatised of everything that I've gone through that I just focused on what I needed focus. I stayed out in the stands. I try to stay away from everybody and just do my job, be out in the ring waiting for everybody. I did what I needed to do just to survive and get out. When it comes to something like that, there's nothing that I saw, but then at the same time, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked, but then I didn't see anything. So it's kind of like, I don't even know what to think. But I wouldn't be sure. <laughs> <laughs> Was, well, I'm wondering, actually, because, I mean, this is sort of like the perfect time where a lot of this alleged activity, I'm very used to using the word alleged, by the way, uh, was taking place. <laughs> And I was just wondering, like, with the locker rooms, like, I don't know if, like, one of the girls was maybe bragging and saying, hey, you know, or or anything like that, or maybe there was just rumblings or rumours, or was it just legitimately nothing you ever heard of at the time? Because I had heat. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> talk to me <laughs> oh, bless you for god's sake but but even in passing like even like say like if i was like in the locker room and i'm just walking through or walking through the bathroom whatever i never heard anything but it's always those um those wonderings like people say stuff but then at the same time people talk crap about me and they weren't true so anytime i heard anything it, i always took it as well, it's probably another person talking about a female talking about talking to another guy because any female that talks to a guy, oh, they're sleeping together. So, I mean, I went through that and it was all false. So when I hear things, it's like you hear things, but for me, I never take it as fact. You just, you know, think, oh God, people are just trying to spread rumors about another nice girl again. Yeah. Uh, we're going to move on from that. I know it was, I know it was sort of, this is a hard question to answer diplomatically in that sense as well. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot there. I'm going to move on to something else. <laughs> I was thinking about this uh, this morning, you know, when I was writing down the script and writing down these questions. 
And I'm sure some of the guys have had to deal with some odd fans or maybe some slightly obsessed fans. But because, you know, WWE is more male, uh, you more of a male viewership. And uh, I'm suspecting that a lot of the women have had to deal with some odd fans more than the guys have. And uh, extreme examples of this is like only a year or two ago, Sonya Deville was uh, like a stalker broke into a house. And Oof. Have you, did you not even hear that? No. Yeah, he just like, he, um, he, uh, I hate to say it, he looked like a stalker as well. He got 10 years recently after he pleaded guilty. But uh, what was your exp- uh, 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 exposure, if any, to uh, the more strange fans out there or like more obsessive fans? Is I've that something lucky. you've ever dealt with? <laughs> I've been lucky, thank goodness. I think the only times like say things have gotten crazy is like when I dated John. I got a lot of death threats all the time. Like what? People, people wanted to kill me. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, what if this is how I die? Like somebody, just because I'm dating you. <laughs> oh, I know. I was like, dude. <laughs> and he's like, nothing's going to happen to you. I'm like, I don't know. Like some of these people are really serious. <laughs> and so just, do, uh, and, is, but, is it like jealous women who were sending death yeah. threats then? <laughs> oh. oh my goodness. I was like, damn, man. <laughs> this is insane but i mean i've been thank goodness i've had really amazing respectful fans like i've never had had that happen maybe sometimes people will find my address and send me um mail and then it ends up it's not even my address it's my family's because i use their their address and i was like they're sending it to them and i was like i'm sorry i tell them i'm sorry and then it made me think oh my goodness well i don't want anything to happen to my family heaven forbid because i'm using their address but honestly, that's the worst it's ever gotten. Usually, say people send weird stuff. Like, I don't ever answer. I actually clean out all my um, DMs. I don't answer anything because I only want to talk to my friends. But people, you know, trying to send me, you know, whatever pictures and whatnot. Like, uh. those are the weirdest things. Um, I've been actually very lucky. Everybody, all my fans are sweet. They're all nice. They're all nice and cool. Well, I was actually going to ask, what's like physically, what's the oddest thing you've ever been sent? I mean, it doesn't have to be something like mega creepy, but there's got to be something strange that sticks out in your mind. Oh my goodness. I can't think of it at the, right now because I've been, I, like, I get like picture frames, I get um, uh, paintings, I get a lot of stuffed animals. I got, uh, it's, I actually keep a lot of the stuff everybody gave, gives me. I have like a whole, you know, I want to take a picture of all the things all the fans gave me because I keep them all. I have bracelets from kids. Um, I have like little pictures that they send me. And oh, and then when they do the little drawings, they do their drawings. And it's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm trying to think. I think maybe one person gave me a clay, like a clay fish. And I was like, a clay fish? Mm. And then it's because I'm a Pisces. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's cute. I was lucky you're not a scorpion then, isn't it? And he sent a fresh one in the mail. No, they handed it to me on, um, uh, like, at appearances. I keep them all. <laughs> Good stuff. I'm, I'm glad you do. I'm glad you do. <laughs> now, uh, this is going to be probably, uh, I don't know, there might be one more, actually. Uh, I already teed you up with this question beforehand. And uh, I said before that I interviewed Shelley Martinez last year. And she said that uh, basically she blames Dave Batista for her getting fired from WWE. And it was because that she was sticking up for you uh, with something that happened with you and Dave. Uh, can you take me through the entire story of that? I can always skip it if you want. I know you said it was all right for me to ask beforehand, but I can always skip it if you want. Yes. Okay, let me tell the story. <laughs> okay. All right. I know you use the word alleged a lot, so I'm going to use it right now. <laughs> During this alleged, like, standing up for me incident, uh, I was on another brand, so I wasn't on the same roster as her. So how can that even occur? <laughs> I was on Raw, and she was in ECW. So we were not on the same roster for this to happen. And from what everybody told me of that incident, she was actually... Um, there was another girl who was dating some other guy and she was having, she was in catering with them. And then she was, you know, got in between their argument. And then I guess Dave was there to witness it and said, Hey, you need, you need to kind of calm down here. 
But what, from what I was told by the like corporate is that she got let go because she was, she was saying some choice words to some higher ups and that, that or something along that line. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, that kind of sounds like Shelly. She's very opinionated, very strong minded. Um, if you're not used to that kind of personality or you're not ready for it, you can take it the wrong way. So when it comes to a business setting, you got to learn how this kind of personality type, like you're, you got to learn how to talk to people. And I think people were just kind of like questioning what to do with her. And from what I heard, that was kind of like the final straw when she started yelling at everybody and catering. So that wasn't a good look for her. Mm. So that's what I was told. Again, hearsay. That's not fact. It's just hearsay. But it had never involved me because I was on a different brand. Uh, I am going to move on. I want to ask you this. Uh, I didn't know this until this morning. Your final match in the original WWE run was in 2011 for number one contender Battle Royal on Raw. Now, do you know the question I'm going to ask? No, but my brother and I were talking about it the other day, and I was like, oh my goodness, what a weird coincidence. I never think of this stuff. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I think actually, I don't know if I found it out or someone sent it to me, but Gail Kim eliminated herself she just escaped the ring and then <laughs> uh she and you are seen running up the ramp laughing what's the story there <laughs> oh my goodness she swears up and down that she never said it she's like i didn't say that i was like gail i was like right behind you watching you it was all unfolding like for me, I got eliminated in the stupidest way, but I was, that was all my idea because I thought it'd be funny, but everybody missed it completely. But when I saw her do that, she was like yelling at the crowd, tuning in the impact next week. And she was telling everybody that all along, like all the way out and hung out because she was tuning in the impact. <laughs> I was like, she's my hero. She's my hero. <laughs> Honestly, she was. And then when, I, when we went to the back, I was like, are you serious? Like, are you serious? So like, fuck yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> did, yeah, did, you, like, oh. did you both realize that was going to be your last match, essentially? Because I imagine maybe Gail Kim did if she was leaving. You, she knew. I didn't. I didn't until the next day. And the next day, it was like, so it basically, it was just kind of like on the walk away. And um, I went to go support John because I had to drive him to SmackDown because he was working on, I think it was either SmackDown or ECW. So I drove him to the show. So I stayed and I was in Gorilla and Vince was passing by <laughs> and he stopped and he turned and he looked at me and he said, you have a good night. And then he turned <laughs> and then walked away and all the guys were like, well, you know, like he made sure to go say goodnight to you. I was like, holy fuck, I'm getting fired. I was like, shut up, Melina. You're not getting fired. I said, he just said, fuck you to me, but with a good night. <laughs> They're like, no. You're crazy. Oh, I guess they need you. What would they do without you? And sure enough, a couple of days later, I got fired. I called it. I called it. Because in my mind, it's like, I mean, somebody just quit and somebody has to pay. And I just happened to be there. Oh, really? Like, yes. uh, so so, <laughs> so it wasn't for like the Battle Royal thing? Or was it because you're like guilty by association with Gail, do you think? No, I don't think because I didn't hang out with anybody. So I just think I just happened to be there. And then it was kind of like, you know what? What is she doing? Is she doing enough? Do we have her doing anything? It was like I was there visually to like, hey, let's really open up like to see what she contributes to. Mm. to everything but in my mind it's like as soon as he he said have a good night i knew i knew i was marked <laughs> <laughs> again oh, no. speculation everybody speculation but yeah, I but mean... you called it i mean you called it absolutely right mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do you know i was sort of looking back at your matches and stuff and 2011 you're challenging for the divas title and then just straight afterwards, you're just on WWE Superstars. And I just always wonder why that is. Why do you put someone in like a number one contender's position? And then if you're not talking to anyone in the office, why do they just decide, actually, what we've decided is something completely different now? No, but then you have to also understand, like, say, take a person like, it, I don't know. I, I don't know who's like nowadays, but or even then. But there were people like, say... 
they would have Seamus back in the day and he would like annihilate everybody. And he's, I mean, looks so strong. And I was like, man, he's kicking ass. He's doing a great job. And then all of a sudden the next week have him job. Like it's like, and then start this pattern of like, okay, he's not that strong. And blah, blah, blah. it's like, they would do that to a lot of talent. And that goes to that, like where I get angry, mm. you take a talent and they, it's not just me. They did this to a lot of people where you push them to the moon and you give them all this, you know, cr- like, like you gave them credibility. You turned them into something extraordinary by giving them um, the, you, you gave them the possibilities. You gave them the storylines. You gave them the push. You gave them all these things. Now the, you have the credibility. what you mean. Yeah. You have what you need in that talent. Why destroy it? They do that with so many people. And it's like, why would you do that? There's a way of having people lose and telling a story without taking away what they're worth, without demolishing what you just created. There's a way of telling that story and they know how to do it. So I don't have the answers, but it, I know that it happened to everybody and not just me. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, uh, it was rumored in what, 2020 maybe that you were re-signing with WWE. How close were you to actually oh. re-signing? Actually, I was, but this is another thing where I keep thinking, were they just dangling a carrot in front of me? And in all honesty, that was the time to dangle a carrot in front of me because my father just died. And the last thing he said, you know, when I, the last time I saw him was if, you know, if I had a chance to go back, to go back. So for him, hell yeah, I'd go back because I wanted to fulfill his vision of what he saw for me. But then at the same time, it's kind of like, well, you know, they when they took that carrot back, I thought, no, like, I, I remember how I felt when I was here last time. Like, I don't think I could go through this again if it's still the same type of of environment. Like, I don't because I don't know. I'm an, I'm older now and I want to work. I don't want to play games. I want to work. I want to work and do the best of my ability and not go through the games I had to go through when I was a kid. And it's it's this thing where I want to do, you know, I want to fulfill my father's dreams, like or what he said. He's like, you were so good at it. He's like, I, I think you should go back. And then part of me thought, like, yeah, I want to, like, I'd love to go back. I would, like, I would love to do that. But when they did that, I was like, never mind. <laughs> Everything happens for a reason. Like, sorry, Daddy, I'll do it in a different way. I'll I'll fulfill your what your vision of me in a different way. Uh, did you sort of get any sense of like closure maybe with Royal Rumble 2022 appearance or uh, would you have liked to have been there more? I mean, tell me the whole, tell me the whole thing about the well, of appearance. Course. Of course I'd love to do more. Like it would have been nice to actually have the full minute that they told me I was going <laughs> to get, especially with Sasha. Like, Oh my goodness. That would have been so beautiful. Like it would have been a more beautiful closing of a chapter for me when it came to WWE but even though they took everything out and they you know they even tried to take my entrance out so if you if you pay attention if I mean maybe it's edited now but I try to do the entrance everybody told me I try to do the entrance and they cut away so then when I I pulled back and they didn't know I was going to do that they they had to get it and I was like I was like, oh my goodness, why are you guys screw with me? Like, it's been a long time since I've been here. Like, I don't understand. Like, are we, are things cool? I don't know what's going on. The more things change, the more they stay the same, eh? <laughs> uh, is, is it, is it, is it, oh, I'm sorry. Response, the fans' response. That's all my takeaway. I'm like, you know what? That's all that matters. You know, they could, whatever they try to take, they could erase me from history, whatever the case may be. It's okay. I don't need that. I don't need validation, but when it comes to the fans, you know, I could, I could die happy with that feeling that they gave me that day. Mm. I'm, I wish I could like bottle that up and give it to everybody for free. You know, here, take this feeling that you guys gave to me because I want everybody to feel that that's nothing but love and goodness. That It's a beautiful thing. And I thank each and every one of you guys for that. Is um is it basically if you were ever to do it now like a even a short term full time run would it be essentially <laughs> WWE or bust or let's say if Impact came calling or <laughs> AEW came calling or whatever it may be would it just not be the same or would you consider that as well? 
Although I would, I think I would consider any storyline that like it's it's any place that would actually invest in good storylines. Like I loved working with Diana and Impact. Like they did such a great job with that. That I think, you know, if if that opportunity came again, hell yeah, I would want to do that. Uh, it all depends on who ha- creates the storyline that just can make me feel like okay, I can end my career on that. Mm-hmm. And it's not just some s- small thing. And there's this thing where everybody has to well back in my day usually for me like not everybody does this but usually for me I go into a place and I put over the young talent because they're the future but I would love my last run for a last storyline to be where we mutually put each other over I don't have to win but make that character look significant like if I come in as a villain like if I come in as a heel oh, let's tell this story where it's this person who just totally betrayed and humiliated or just disrespected somebody beyond belief. And then we tell a great story that that runs for a while before we end it. I don't mind the losses. It's just how we tell the story. Uh, but then at the same time, it's like, man, I'm always like, I'm always putting everybody over. It'd be nice like for once. <laughs> like, <there's somebody laughs> me for my last match please <laughs> who would uh who would be let's say like one of the younger generation who's in like a major federation uh who would be your ideal opponent who's who's someone who's working oh. now that you think man i'd love to make them oh my goodness it's i you keep hating my polit like my i, like know, my... No, I don't hate them at all <laughs> there's so much great talent and there's so many women that i would love to work with or lo- love to to teach another side it's like they're already like great as it is but i don't like some people it's like well let's do this kind of story where we have this way of talking to each other because i don't see that nowadays when i go to shows it's this lengthened storyline where we bought like we come together and create all this amazing stories and rapport and promos cutting it on each other and all this happiness where it's it's the old school style of building each other up because when we, whoever's going to lose to each other, we have to build somebody up so that they're strong. Because who wants to beat a person who we keep saying is a loser? That means I didn't beat anybody. So we build each other up. This beautiful storyline that you don't really get to see nowadays. Mm. I would love to work with anybody, really. But I'd rather work with somebody who wants to work with me. Mm. That's the best uh, partnership. Because usually, like, when you're thrown together and if there's not nobody wants to work with you i want to work with everybody like i'm i'm pathetic (laughs) i'm like oh yeah i love to work with you and then some people are like yeah whatever like go away old person (laughs) and i'm just like okay (laughs) but when you find a person who wants to work with you magic happens Mm -hmm. and that's what i want having said that we're going to go to our final game now i'm just looking at the clock here we've got 20 minutes or something like that um so don't worry we can um it, it'll fly by i promise you i'll promise you 20 minutes isn't that long um it's i call it the firing line it's essentially the same as name association but the thing's reversed i'm going to give you the name of somebody and if you can give me a little story on them fantastic and the first name is and this is going to be an easy one for you fit finley oh my goodness i say incredible <laughs> Oh, because if I wish, I wish he, when I first started wrestling, like one of my trainers could be on a day-to-day basis, not like, okay, I'm going to help you put your matches together. I wish that he trained me from the get-go because that dude, he would just take like a pinky or, or like your hand or your wrist and like control your body and make you fall and all these crazy things just by doing one single thing, like a little movement, a little like touch. And it's like, Oh my God, how did you learn how to do that? Teach me. (laughs) He's the type of person where I, I would want to soak in all the knowledge that he has because he's that incredible and funny. If, uh, if you'd asked him like, cause obviously he knows quite a lot of shoots, hold maneuvers. If he, if you'd asked him, would you say, can you just show me how to do this for real? And he'd show you or would he not? He, he'd like show me by applying it on me, but not really show me. <laughs> he's like, let me see if I can just take it. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> next one, we've talked about her a couple of times, to be honest. Stiffest, worst driver, Gillian Hall. Yep, yep, true. 
every time I've gotten in the car with her, because she loves the speed. She loves the speed. She's like, I know what I'm doing, though. She's like, other people, they drive fast, but they don't know what they're doing. I do. I was like, I don't know. It doesn't feel like you do, Julia. <laughs> and then this one time, like, it was Eminem, and we drove to, um, we're driving to the next show somewhere. And we kept telling her, we're running out of gas. Like, look at the gauge. It's We're already on E. No, the next one. The next one. She kept saying that for the longest time. And then finally, finally, she decides to finally go out and get some gas. And right when we're going on the off-ramp, the car dies. Right? Like, beyond, like, past the incline. So we barely made it over the incline. And then everybody had to get out, except for me, because I'm the weakest. <laughs> No upper arm strength at all, but Jillian's way strong. Like, she is strong, and everybody had to po- push the car to the gas station. And thank goodness it wasn't far. But that's the kind of that's the kind of driving <laughs> or adventures of driving. Baby boo boo. Oh, she's Charlie not talking to me, everybody. Just so you know. Uh, with- <laughs> uh, I've got to ask with Jillian, right? Of all the characters that someone could have. Having a gigantic sort of scarab-like mole on your face. I mean, do, do you remember ever like talking to her and just saying, "How do you feel about this character?" Oh my goodness! I kind of, I guess, I didn't like ask her because I was worried or scared of kind of making it worse. But you did, need, did you ever prod it? Did, what did it feel like? Was it spongy? Oh, oh man, everybody did. <laughs> it was a sponge. <laughs> but no, my favorite thing is when. Um, when it was the time where, uh, what is his name? When it was Boogeyman, when Boogeyman bit the mole off, that was the best part ever because they made it out of gummy. So that was the time where I'm like, oh my goodness, can I take a piece of it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't, did you? I, I couldn't out of just like, I couldn't get my head around that. <laughs> no, they would get so mad. <laughs> I'm going to move on. Next name, Nick Densmore. Nick Densmore, OVW, I think of OVW. He wasn't really around, like, I remember he was there for a little bit, but then, like, he went and they moved him up, and he was doing, like, the... Oh, my God, what was this game? He was doing, like, the... Eugene. He's doing Eugene, yeah. I remember that. Next one, Maria Canellis. Maria. I remember doing, like, her little hippity hop. (laughs) <laughs> like at the end of the um, the entrance. Any specific stories about Maria? Not really. I remember. Um, I remember this one time we all took pictures together. <laughs> we took pictures together because I used to do this thing where um, whenever Mickey would put on Tanner, I would just put a little bit more. <laughs> she put on more Tanner, and then I'd put a little bit more, and then the next thing I knew, we all looked to the side. And Maria was doing the same thing. <laughs> it was so dark. <laughs> and we all, I remember we took a picture of it. I need to find that picture because we were all so tan, all three of us. And then when I, I remember looking at it a couple of years ago, thinking, how the hell did we walk out like that with all that tanner on? <laughs> it was so heavy. It was almost like blackface <laughs> by that point. It was like we went out for like one of those bodybuilding competitions oh, where yeah. you like painted on. That's how it looked like. <laughs> Next one is, uh, I don't know if this is going to be a, a big answer, a small answer, Triple H. Triple H. Of course, I think of the spitting of the water. Um, you know, he's actually, uh, he he gave me great advice. I remember he was really good at advice. He One time he told me, and this was the one I carry the most with me, one of the ones, but he always told me every time you get into the ring, act like it's commercial. And he said it didn't, it doesn't matter what commercial it is or what it's for. It could be for a new fan that's barely watching you for the first time. It could be for you could showing the company what you're capable of to do this next storyline. It could be for anything. Just whenever you get into the ring, do it for something because you want that commercial for people to see it and see what who you are and what your worth is. And it's like, yeah, we fucking do that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the transition with um, <clears throat> basically Triple H to Paul, the office guy, almost? Did that happen like so gradually that no one noticed, or what happened there? No, I don't think so. That I think that didn't happen while I was around. I don't think 
he was still like kind of one of the boys or something like he in my mind when when i was there it's like he was one of the boys but not like you no know, a person to respect but still like still jokes around and hangs out with the guys mm. uh next one rick flair oh <laughs> of course the woo <laughs> oh my goodness in my mind, I'm like, how how does he have the energy? He's just like, n- nothing could, and knock on wood, thank goodness, that nothing could, like, kill this man because he could do, he's been through so much. I'm like, how many plane crashes and you're still there? Like, the hospitalization, you're still there. How much wrestling have you done? Still kicking? Like, this guy keeps going. So he cracks me up. Did you, <laughs> Was he someone who... I, in my mind, he's always in the backstage laughing and joking. Was he someone who was approachable? Yeah. But then again, like, I'm a chick, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Then you've got but... that going for you, definitely. <laughs> uh, next name is Lita. Lita. Let's see. Amazing. Like, the one that started all the love of the red hair. And let's see. I remember, I wish that we would have worked with her, but well, because I was a heel and she was a heel, we never got a chance to work with each other. But I remember, I think we were there when, I think we were on the roster. I think Eminem was around because I remember being backstage and seeing her and Trish have that main event match together. And when she she did a dive to the outside in Scorpion, I was like, oh, it was one. It's kind of like almost like the Joey thing where it's like, like, is she okay? And she got up and I was like, how is he doing that? Oh my goodness, it was so scary. But man, bless her. Mm. I'm glad she's okay. But that was like, it was incredible to be there and witness that there at the arena live. And that was such an amazing moment. Uh, the next name is Eve Torres. I believe you wrestled a fair amount, didn't you, Eve? I think so towards the end. And then we also tagged with each other. Mm-hmm. She, to me, I, I don't know what happened um, after I left, but I remember she's a person who, like, there was so much potential to, you know? Like, she had the athletic ability, and uh, I just feel like with working with the right storylines and the right people, like, I could hope that she did so much, like, so much incredible stuff. The, but, uh, the Undertaker. Oh, legend. Like, the feeling of his of his entrance will never cease to be as like incredible you know it'll be the same as when i watched it as a kid it sends those chills but in like in such a like nostalgic way down your spine mm. like i'll never forget that i think that's such a, like a rare thing to be able to do in wrestling what is a locker room leader what are their roles well technically like their roles is it's somebody to look up to where you could I guess ask them questions and be able to have them watch your work or just watch the way they are and the way they work and the way they conduct themselves and follow in their footsteps or be able to ask those questions for like to them or just somebody who just you see that their work and the way they are is something to be admired and looked up to. So they don't need to be the person who says, let me teach you something, kid. Like they could be the people who just being themselves is leading the rest of the group. Did you, uh, I, 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 I can't believe I didn't ask this earlier, and I wish I had now. Did you ever uh, witness a wrestler's court? Oh, but I did. Like the, the guys who, like, they were supposed to punch each other. I witnessed a lot of wrestlers' courts, and it was not... It, it isn't like the stories of back in the day where somebody, there was, like, an injustice being done, and we got to settle this. And it wasn't anything like that. It was more of like torturing people. And it was awful. It was awful. And in my mind, I think, and now I was a part of one too. So in my mind, I think, why would anybody put anybody through that? Like, what is the benefit of it? What is, what do you, how do you get off on this? Like, it's so awful. But at the same time, I think, well, if this is what people have done for for years on end and this is what they grew up watching i get or doing i guess this is normal for for the older generation i don't know well I, I, i'll tell you so i i do a weekly show with dutch mantel he was zeb coulter shortly after you left he became a manager with jack swagger and he invented wrestlers court and the what it originally was 
was he would just make up charges uh, to charge the Undertaker with. He wasn't even the Undertaker at the time. This was in Memphis while he was still before he was even in WCW. Just to wind him up, just say you've been romancing the girls too much, or you turned up four minutes late, and it was just one giant in joke. That's teasing, right? That, that was just late teasing. Exactly. It was originally, That's yeah, exactly. It was originally a teasing <laughs> thing. Just, you know what I mean? Just, just to make the time pass, essentially, while you're on the road. And then at some point, it turned into, yeah, more of a hazing thing. And I wonder when that happened. I don't know when. The next name is the Bella Twins. Bella Twins. And then, and then I think of their, their whole little entrance. Let's see, a story. I think one of the first times... Oh, like, this is a good story to tell. One of the first times I ever got drunk, because I didn't start drinking until, like, say, 25, and I didn't really drink. I just didn't want to drink. Uh, all those then, wasted years. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then when I turned 30, that's when I started, like, okay, like, I'm going to hang out with people and start drinking. And there was one time I hung out with them, and it reached, I felt so bad. There was a time where I just, like, I was drunk and I was throwing up and all I, like, I remember them holding my hair back. They were so, I was like, Oh my goodness. Am I like part of the sisters? <laughs> <laughs> They're holding my hair back and I'm throwing up. <laughs> they were so sweet. Like, you know, they didn't have to do that. And it's like moments like that is stupid as it sounds. And you know, it, it shows what people are, are, capable of what they're what they would do for another human being yeah. and that's i stuff like that even though it sounds crazy because like oh yeah we were drunk you know for me it's that's the kind of people they are like they they value their friendships and they're caring and they're loving and they were willing to do something like that for me and for me it's like thanks for being there thanks for being my sister for that what's your drink of choice oof moscow mules <laughs> If you tell me, if you tell me, like I say, we go somewhere and that's the first drink I order. I like to go to places and try different, whatever their specialty is, because I want to taste whatever is popular in whatever state or whatever country. I like the to to taste like the countries and the, and the cities and stuff. So it's like I like to ask for that. But when it's just where it's not a place where I'm trying out new things, I always go Moscow Mules. Mm. And what is that? I've never heard that before. Oh, it's vodka, vodka with um, ginger beer. Hmm, that's not bad. I like, I like a ginger beer. Uh, next name is Car. Oh, ginger beer is so good. I know it is. <laughs> it is nice. It is. Oh my goodness. Is Cockney rhyming slang over here for something else? But I won't say what it is at the moment. Carlito oh. is our next name. Sorry, I'll leave that mystery. I'll leave the mystery out there. I'll tell you afterwards. Yeah, Mr. Googling. (laughs) Yeah, go on. Oh, Carlito. A story about Carlito. Uh, For everyone else I've interviewed, uh, I used to ask who was the uh, biggest ladies' man. And if they'd been in a promotion with Carlito, it was Carlito. I mean, he always, like, put himself in the position of talking to all the ladies. (laughs) Oh, ladies' man, I don't know. Oh, that <laughs> he was just always the person like all the girls like to hang out with, you know, because he's like one of the girls. <laughs> Is he? For me, for me, I was like because he always like hung out with us. He knew he knew like well not I you know I always go away and I always like in my own little world, but he'd always be a person cracking jokes, funny, um, just I don't know. He was easy to talk to, but. It wasn't like like in my mind. I don't know, but then that's different because you know, like I said, all the guys in wrestling for me were like brothers to me, or that's the way I perceived them. Where you go outside and then you start talking to people who like have this like this charm factor, you know. And then you start really like realizing what game is, and it's like wow, okay, these like you mean like ladies man and you know the brother. <laughs> He did the friend. <laughs> but he was always one to where it's like, I remember, and of course it's because I sell it, it's because it would drive me crazy. But he would always put me on the spot of cash cab. You would see how I, I'm like when you're asking me questions, right? How I get put on the spot and I go blank. He would do that all the time. And he'd go cash cab and then start asking me questions. I was like, like the game it. show cash cab. I vaguely remember that. <laughs> Dude, stop it. I know nothing. I know nothing. 
Next one, <laughs> next one I'm going to ask you is Mickey James. Mickey. Yeah. Uh, I always think of like her her little boots. Yeah. <laughs> and the way she when she runs the ropes. So if you notice, like when she runs the ropes and she hits the ropes, her she does like this little like Mario brother like boop, and her butt goes on the second rope. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> It's so cute. She, to me, she reminds me of like Mario Brothers, where it's like. <laughs> you see, that's the kind of thing that I imagine Rip Rogers would go apoplectic over. I noticed that when people run the ropes too, because <laughs> I was taught a different way, and I think maybe it was because of Rip, because he was adamant about the reasons why. So I noticed that, but I don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next name is the great Carly. Oh, great Carly! Oh my goodness, he was so freaking tall. I just keep thinking, like I try to remember. Oh my goodness, I'm trying to remember a story. I just always remember him being so happy and smiling and always just like, you know, hey, like, okay, let's go somewhere. And always ready to go. But I don't have any stories because I think during that time I was really like introverted in. <laughs> I was just really like, mm. Yeah, and, you, and if you're introverted, you're not going to go to the Great Carly, are you? Huh? I said, if you're introverted, you're not going to go straight to the Great Carly, are you? Because oh, he's an intimidating no looking dude. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever go to India with Great Carly and just see him like get no. mobbed? But in my mind, I'm like, how could I not have? Like, that's insane. Because mm. I remember talking to Katie Forbes and like uh, seeing like pictures and the stories. I'm like, nah, that I would have loved to gone. Because it's like, oh, especially like to see everything and taste the food and just meet the people and just to be in a different place. Like, I would have loved it. Mm. Especially with the family, because usually he always gets like everybody that we all work with. Next name is Michelle McCool. <laughs> to me, let's see. When I when I think of her, I think of because you know what? it's it's funny how when you're in the moment and you look at matches at the time, especially for me, it's like I always move on to the next thing. I always move on to what what am I going to do next? Um, what's the next storyline? What's the next show? What's where are we driving to? It's like once you get done with something, you go into the next thing or review my match. And, get, and I watch matches to pick myself apart and I just annihilate like everything I've done. And I'm my own worst critic. So usually when I watch stuff back, that's what I'm doing. I never took the time to appreciate what we did. So it took me a while later to watch those those matches back. And it's it to realize that those matches that I had with Michelle McCool, like I should have treasured them more and said it more in those moments because those are really, because we had a great chemistry because we played off each other a lot and we took each other's ideas and we turned it into something. And we always wanted to like sneakily do something more so that we don't get in trouble. But it's like, I, I appreciate her and love her so much for those moments because who else would I have would have done that with? Mm. So I'm really great. For her being around this is um i uh, i don't know if this is going to be a bit of a weird question but like obviously you've dated you dated johnny for a very long time she dated now is married to undertaker is it always some of the girls who aren't dating wrestlers at the time do they look at the girls who are dating wrestlers at the time and think something i don't know it just always seems like i i don't it I just feel like everything kind of felt weird when Eddie died. Like when he passed away, the dynamics of whoever's single, whoever's dating somebody, whoever's married, like it didn't matter because we were all family. And then all of a sudden, like it seemed like the family started falling apart after I, uh, to me, it was just a significant point that I say that, but who knows when it really started falling apart. So it was never really that somebody, people would look down upon somebody who had a relationship or not. I never really noticed that. It just seemed like sometimes when I was in a relationship, I don't know how Michelle felt or if she felt this way, but then she, you know, it probably didn't because no one would do this like to them, but it always felt like they were trying to separate us. So they would always like put us on different brands or 
cause something to put a strain on our our relationship like they would purposely you can't tell me it wasn't on purpose <laughs> you're like i mean big coincidence big coincidence that nine times out of ten john would have the match before mine and they'd go over on time like uh-huh. <laughs> they he could have had they could have put him in any other place in the card you know but they would always put him in front of mine so then it's because they knew like the guys always run over on time and then they knew like they wanted to see like would i get upset would i like say something to him and then he'd always come bless his heart he'd always come back and he goes i'm sorry <laughs> it's like just go. <laughs> I gotta go up there. <laughs> hey, well, at least you probably, you know, at least you're pretty much all like showered and and done it around the same time. It, it was, do you know, because you mentioned that, and that was a question I didn't get to beforehand. Was were the women's matches nearly always the victims of of matches going over all the time? All the time, because like I guess like the guy's mentality was, oh, who cares? It's a girls' match, or it. it you know, oh, but we had a lot of, I remember those stories, I'd hear stories of, yeah, but we really needed to do this, like, do this uh, spot and this spot. And, and I just look at them thinking, what? Like, you could have taken anything else out. Like, if we can make time happen in that short amount of time, like, how can you not with all that time that you have? Like, really, did you really need to lay down for, like, 30 seconds longer than you were already laying down <laughs> selling that move like there's certain things where i'm just like really <laughs> but... I, I did you know it's, it's funny because you mentioned lance storm earlier as one of your trainers and i heard an interview of him some time ago and he said it was the same thing with him his match would always get cut for time because he was the one of the only wrestlers good enough to work to any time cue and therefore he was also a, he was almost a victim of his own talent in that sense Wow. You know, I wouldn't doubt that because I didn't make any time happen. <laughs> it was like, but it was exciting to me because oddly enough, I did get excited being able to make those times. And it's like, okay, what was the time? Like going to the back and asking, okay, what was the time? And hitting your mark. It's, you know, it just feels like, you know, I don't know. It's like, I created that. I did that. And also when it comes to certain things, like when they cut your time, and then you re- re- rearrange the match. And it's like, and nobody knows how you rearranged it. It doesn't even look like it was rearranged. And I love being able to ha- like to be that person that did that. And it, thank goodness for the girls I work with, because you also need great listeners, like people who trust you and understand like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Some people fight you on it. And it's like, you don't understand. So thank goodness for them because they were great to work with that we could edit and we could recreate like or create these stories in such a short time and edit it all on the fly like it's such a beautiful art to be able to do that that oh my goodness i'm sorry to say but it's like a high (laughs) to be able to do that (laughs) to to alter time it feels like altering time like i slowed time down to be able to rearrange this whole entire match it's such an amazing feeling I don't think I could do that now because I have no concept. I've been out of the ring so long that I don't even think I could do that again unless I, you know, worked at it again. Yeah, and then it's second nature, that kind of thing. Uh, I'll give you a couple more notes. I am very sorry. I was, I was just chatting to you for so long. I wasn't even keeping an eye on time. I'll, I'll, I'll limit it to a couple of names and then I will thank you uh, for your time. Um, Randy Orton. Randy Orton. Oh, my goodness. The way he moves in the ring is amazing. Like, I... There's only a certain amount of people in the world or in history that could create a character that's so unique that it's like, how how did this come about? How are you the way you, you are? Like, it's so intriguing. But I just wish he'd wear knee pads. <laughs> Do you think it's weird when guys don't wear knee pads and it just sort of just looks like they're in their underwear and a bit perverted? gets mad at me when i say that because i think I, cody rhodes was the same thing yeah, i was, I was like, just gonna say cody have... rhodes yeah he looked like he just got out the hotel and forgot to put clothes on <laughs> this is i guess like they were telling me like back in the day you know wrestlers didn't wear any pads so this is like their mark from carrying on what happened traditionally back in the day but in my mind i thought 
Well, they weren't really taking care of their bodies and they worked a different style that protected their knees. Now we're in an era where your knees are going to get damaged if you do not wear these things. So protect yourself, like take care of your body. Like you guys look good. Protect the knees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you know, someone told me, uh, I won't say who it is, but it's someone we both know. And they said uh, they were with Randy Orton. And, uh, do you remember when he was uh, suspended for behavioral issues that time? And he had to go to a, a behavioral <laughs> issue, issue uh <laughs> Uh, almost like rehab centre kind of thing. Really? Yeah, and, and I said, oh, can you tell me any stories from that? And he just went, absolutely not. I don't <laughs> remember that. What what year was that? Uh, early 2006, I think. Because I feel like he was always there for, well, again, like, I don't pay attention to anything. So I just, I just, I collect these stories like Wasn't Pokemon he... cards, you know. But I want to hear these stories. <laughs> In my mind, I'm thinking... Like, in my mind, I thought he was there the entire time. So the fact that he wasn't at some point, what was going on in my head? Oh, it, was, it, was like a, it was like a month or two. So it wasn't like a protracted amount of time. But anyway, I'll give you a couple more names. But Randy, like, you could, you, you know, you'd notice if he's not around. Hmm. So how did I not notice? Uh, who am I going to ask? If the I actually written Cody Rhodes, so I won't ask about Cody. Um, Brian Kendrick. Ryan. Well, like when I think of him, I think now I think of chef because I think he wants to become a chef. So like I think of food now. <laughs> and so he's like, well, that's something I'm thinking about. Like, no, do it. <laughs> uh, I'll be there with you. Eat it. <laughs> like <laughs> I'll be the taste tester. <laughs> he but he, he a... needed feeding up back in the day as well. He was he was a he was a slender lad. But all that running that they did, oh my goodness, like. Seriously, they just always run around and move like they he he was so nimble. Like wow. But yeah, I think of kind soul now. It's more so like the person that I know um outside of wrestling. So yes, he was they were great when it came to him and Paul. They were great in the ring and th that's one of the the tag teams. That's one of the talent where I think god, they if written the right storylines if they could have done this right, they could have been more. And they like the company dropped, dropped the ball on them. And I wish that because people were getting behind them, they loved them. So why invest all this storyline and then do nothing with it? It's so insane. But Brian, outside of that, I'm like, especially like when you get older, you kind of like, you know, appreciate each other and our personalities more mm -hmm. and life more. So to hear him like this, he still looks young, but I'm like, you like, you, you sound like a wise old man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure Jesus I think I can't remember if it was Brian or Paul London, but he recently said that Joey Mercury was a 90 year old man in a 20 year old body. Oh, my goodness. He always was because he's a genius at what he does and he takes his work seriously. So he's always been that way. Yeah. <laughs> he's funny. Like, don't get me wrong. He, he He's funny. But when it comes to explaining, like, he's a great teacher. Like, he has a wealth of knowledge inside that head. He's another person I learned from. And if it wasn't from working with him, I wouldn't learn as much as I, I have. Because working side by side with him and him explaining things and the reasons why help so much more. Like, he, it's like OVW gave me the foundation of all this and gave me a great start. And then Joey's helping me the graduation type mm. of deal. Yeah, it's like a portable... OVW with you at all times, isn't it? Yes! Oh, I will give you a couple more then, and then I, and then I will stop. Uh, the Miz. Miz. I remember um, back in the day when I first started uh, EWS, back when I first started Indies, uh, I actually worked a show with him when he first, I think he first started. It was like after, what, what was the show? He The Real World. So I remember thinking, what is this guy doing here? He's in wrestling? <laughs> <laughs> but you know you can't and and then fast forward like years later when we both have contracts and he's the same person like in that bar that i met him at like a after the show he was loud the loudest guy in the room you know and you'd like turn heads like who's that dude <laughs> oh wow. it's miz and then flash forward to like wwe who's like who's that loud person oh it's of course the, the voice it's miz that's funny to see like it's how things have changed but stayed the same but in a good way 
Uh, so I've said two. I'll stick to two. Man, I really wanted to ask about John Heidenreich, but it probably isn't a good story about him. We'll say William Regal. Uh, he's always been sweet. And then whenever I think of him, I think of like the Michelle McCool and Hershey storyline where he was just like trucking. Why? Is there bad stories about him? No, 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 no. I've just got so many names. I'm trying to skip him. <laughs> <laughs> give us give us a regal story regal you know what he's he's a person where okay i didn't get to like was it i was i think i worked with him once in the ring but when he was out there every day like before the shows and stuff like that guy i i want to have his legs i want to have his legs for the fact that he was always doing squats like endless amounts of squats on the side of the ring <laughs> and i was like how, how can you do that for so long like that's that's serious <laughs> uh makes me wish i could have done that maybe i wouldn't have had knee problems you know <laughs> yeah yeah do but well. he's an amazing guy he's I'm... great to talk to wealth of knowledge but i'll always remember him with doing the squats <laughs> That's like that sounds like the Bob Backlund thing that he used to do. Just used to do t- two hours of squats or something like that, just for himself, I, I suppose. <laughs> Last one. Every day. Yeah. Last one, and it's not someone from WWE. It's someone you tagged up with uh, more recently, Velvet Sky. Oh, Velvet. <laughs> well, when I think of her, I think of her love for animals. <laughs> Because I, let's see, she she was sweet to like my dogs, and then whenever I see her and she she talks about her cats and birds and all this stuff, I'm like, she's just I see I envision her like Snow White, and she goes walks out her front door, and then all the birds and animals come to her. <laughs> That's the way I envision her because she's land, just landing on a... her finger, and then you know songs happen, that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh my goodness, I love her. She's so sweet. <laughs> Listen, I've taken up so much of your time already. I want to thank you for being a fine, fine guest. And before I let you go, hit me with all the plugs you've got. I mean, I've got like five already written down, but give them all. Okay. The easiest way to find everything me is realmelina.com. R-E-A-L-M-E-L-I-N-A. Um, also, I just want to let you guys know that uh, I'm working for a promotion called Ultimate Women of Wrestling. These ladies are working very hard to give good content. I'm very excited for the future of this promotion. And I'm trying to put stuff out there on my YouTube channel so then you guys could watch, get to know the women, and then follow their stories on, on the show. So if you could show any support to these girls, please do. All the links to UWW is also on romalina.com, so it could be easier for you guys to find all that. So just want to thank you for everything. Thank you for your kindness, sweetness, support. Love you from the bottom of my heart. It's not just a thing to say. I genuinely feel that. I love you guys. Thank you for everything. This... This whole entire ride when it comes to wrestling, whether you love me or you hate me, it's okay. I just, the end result is a beautiful thing. The learning lessons that I've, you know, have have learned uh, that I've gone through, the support and the goodness of people that I've I've come in contact with, it was all worth it all. Mm. So thank you guys for each and every one of those moments. I love you so much for that. And uh, thank you very much for spending so much time with me, being a great guest. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you again next time. Mm -hmm.